Hey everyone, it's Shane here. Um, if you can hear me, oh yes, you can. Yeah. Um, just wanted to welcome uh, you all on behalf of the iMoot team. Uh, thanks for coming into iMoot, and uh, just want to uh, welcome and thank uh, Joshua Bragg, who's sharing the presentation with us uh, right now, making homework work with Moodle. Uh, looking forward to hearing it. Thanks, Shane. Um... Thanks for all of you guys for coming. Um, uh, this is uh, my third iMoot and the first time presenting, so um, I'm looking forward to it. This is um, presentation is, is something is is more or less what got me started with Moodle in the first place. Um, I'm a high school chemistry teacher, and I was having an incredible problem uh, getting my students to do the practice that I knew they needed to do. Um, and I was trying to come up with ways of facilitating that and landed in Moodle as a result and have really just never looked back at all. Um, so let me, um, let's just kind of start with kind of where I see homework as, a, as an issue and what I see um, being important about homework. A lot of this comes from my background, particularly as a chemist, there are just certain things that to be a practicing chemist, you just have to know. Um, it, one of the most basic things is how to name compounds and figure out the formulas of compounds. And it's one of those things that actually as a, when I was first starting to teach was incredibly difficult to teach because it was so automatic that it wasn't one of those things that I even thought about anymore. For students to be able to do any sort of complicated task, subtasks that they that make up that larger task need to be as automated as possible. Anytime they spend kind of figuring out the little tiny things along the way makes it that much harder to do the big complicated thing. One of the most important uh, bits of research that I've seen uh, kind of in my teaching career is the information on cognitive load theory. Um, and any time that we can increase the automaticity of, uh, of students' performance, then we know that we're getting to the point where they can do more complicated things with it. A student who doesn't just know that 5 times 6 is 30 is going to have an incredibly difficult time figuring what 5 times 6x is. So I see homework as practice. We have to have practice in order to build that automaticity to make sure that the eventually, by the end of my class, they're going to be able to take all of these individual skills and put them together to do something that's reasonably complicated. So the system that I've kind of developed over the, the past few years is kind of designed to do that. Um, and so I've, I've got a few different tasks that I use with my students and, um, and I'm going to just kind of walk you through kind of the structure of all of these things and the things that I think are important to build this system so that you can set it up to make sure that your students are really getting the practice in that they need to be able to do the more complicated things eventually. So I have a few different assignments that I use. And really all of these assignments that are designed for practice are actually built with just the Moodle quiz system. Now I don't call them quizzes with students um, because it would tend to get confusing, but I've got a few different kind of tasks that they have to do that are all designed to do to build that automaticity in along the way, but they hit different little targets of those of that automaticity. So the first, the kind of the most basic is homework, just generic practice. Second is kind of the step past that where students need to be able to practice in a timed arrangement so that they know how well they're doing. Time is actually a reasonably good sense of how automatic with something you are. If you can't do it quickly, you're having to think about it along the way, it's not really automatic yet. And so the faster you can do something, the more automatic it is. 
So that means you've gotten at least further along the uh, further along the path to these more complicated things. The other piece along the way are um, just some test review types. So we're we're getting close to the test at this point with my students, and and they want to be able to review for things. Uh, one of the one of the things that um, students tend to struggle with uh, fairly mightily in my class is uh, multiple choice problems, uh, simply because well-written multiple choices is, is incredibly difficult. Um, you have to really kind of know what you're doing to make sure that you are, um, make sure that you can do things well. If you've got really poorly written multiple choice, then that's another story entirely. But well-written multiple choice takes some real understanding of what's going on. The other piece is just some problems that they need to work. And quite frankly, these problems are much more important to chemistry because nearly all of chemistry are, are the problems that we solve. So I'm going to walk you through kind of each of these different assignments that I use. At any point along the way, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, and we'll make sure that we kind of answer those as we go along. So the first piece of the puzzle is the practice itself, the first homework. Students are given uh, multiple different homework assignments over the course of the over the course of a unit, and they're all generally fairly short assignments, just a couple of questions, five or fewer, that are designed to focus on exactly what they need to practice, the skill that they need to practice along the way. I do grade them, um, but students, um, I want students to practice these things, not get it right immediately. And so one of the things that I love most about the quiz system in Moodle is all of the different quiz behaviors that you can choose. My personal favorite is the adaptive mode with no penalties. Basically, the way that works is a student has a check button that they can essentially hit an unlimited number of times until they finally get the answer that they're looking for. And so the way this works in practice is I'll give students a, uh, a sheet in class that has all of their, uh, their practice problems on it. They can work them all out, type in the answer into Moodle, and hopefully they get it correct. If not, then there needs to be some sort of feedback for them on what they've done wrong. And so you'll see I've got a couple of examples here, one where a student uh, used the incorrect number of sig figs. If you don't know what sig figs are, it's a chemistry thing be glad that you don't, quite frankly. Um, here on the end, you can see a, a much different answer here. Uh, if you look at this problem here, you see the, um, see if I can zoom in just a little bit here. Um, to look at that answer for that problem. We can all kind of look at that number and say, uh, no, there are not that many hours in 9,000 seconds. That's clearly the wrong answer, and yet I have students type this in on a regular basis. It's a, it's a matter of the math, looking at the math and, and typing things in correctly, either into their calculator or setting things up in the problem wrong. And so they need some feedback to be able to see that that's not right. What they've done here in this particular case is instead of dividing by 60 twice, they've actually multiplied by 60 twice. So having that um, feedback in there helps them figure out exactly what's going on in each of the in each of the problems and make sure that they can really understand what's going on. I use the exact same questions for everyone for these practice assignments so that students can help each other. In fact, that's part of the process that we'll talk about a little bit later on. The next piece is the time to practice. So remember, the goal here is to introduce and, and develop um, students getting to the point of these problems and these practices being entirely automatic. And so I've designed very short one, two, uh, this is actually a fairly long quiz in my book that has three questions on it um, that are designed for short, very quick 
chances for you to see if you can do it at the speed that you should be able to do it at if it's automatic. These are set up as deferred feedback because um, mostly that it's stress inducing for students to try to take a quiz under a time limit and have that check button uh, there. If they were to have the check button there and check it while they were doing it, uh, they would end up getting very stressed out when they saw that their first answer was wrong and were still running out of time on how to figure it out. Um, so the setup is deferred feedback. These are all different random questions that are pulled from a bank. Um, and so students will all get essentially different quizzes. I'd give students two attempts at this to give them a chance to first practice it, see how they're doing. If they need to do some more practice to be able to do well on it, then they can do some more practice along the way and then take the second attempt to make sure that you're doing well there. One of the most important pieces of this is making sure that you set the time limits well for this. And this takes quite a bit of um, essentially student data to make sure that things are going well here and you're putting things in kind of the right time frame for what they need. The next piece is how we set up the, the multiple choice part of the review. One of the other question behaviors in Moodle that I love to death is certainty-based marking. So for those of you who are not familiar with certainty-based marking, if we take a look over here at this question, you'll see that the question is up here and then you can select the answer choices. But then notice this piece down here at the bottom that lets you rate how sure you are about the answer. The grading is then done based on the correct answer and how sure you said you were about the answer. What we want, obviously, are students who can get things right and they are very sure that they have them right. It would be really bad for a student to be really sure that they are right about something and be completely and totally wrong. It's much better in my mind for someone to be wrong about something and realize that they are wrong than it is for someone to be wrong and not have a clue that they're wrong. And so the certainty-based marking grading rewards understanding how well you know something. So just to kind of give you a sense of this, um, if you answer correctly and mark very sure, then you are actually awarded six points out of one point for that, for that particular problem. Excuse me, let, let me take that back. You're awarded three points out of, uh, uh, out of one point for that particular problem. So if you were to take an entire quiz with certainty-based marking and get every problem right and say that you're absolutely sure with something, you could get 300 out of 100 points on it. Now the flip side of this is if you answer incorrectly and say that you are very sure about the answer, then Moodle actually takes off a negative six points out of one point. So the other extreme is if you got every single question wrong, but said you were very sure that they were all right, then you would get a negative 600 out of 100 to average in your grade. So one of the things that this introduces is students have to really assess how well they know the material in addition to just do they know the material in the first place. So Tabitha's point about question design and quiz design and feedback. Feedback is the one of the single most important pieces in any quiz design, any question design piece in Moodle. You can get instantaneous feedback to students based on how the answers that they put in. This is something you just cannot do unless you are sitting with a student one-on-one. -on -one. This is 
the this is the kind of thing that Moodle is really amazing for in terms of quizzes and for people to not put feedback on their quiz and quiz questions is is just missing the one of the biggest points about it um Miranda you're you're spot on with multiple choice if you don't do that multiple choice question well then you're not going to have a chance at it um a, a chance of getting good data if you um if you know how to how students are going to make mistakes and you try out the questions along the way and look at the statistics you can do a lot of good things to make even even po fairly poor questions much better along the way but it takes a lot of time and energy to get it there so once a student's done with the certainty based marking they get a report that'll look something a little like this they'll get a grade and so this is an actual student's grade report from one of my classes from a recent um, from a recent multiple choice thing. You can see they got a 72 out of 100. Um, in terms of their accuracy grade, you can see here they really only answered about 58% of those questions right. If you look at the breakdown here, this is where you really start getting things that are interesting. Because now you can say, the student, you were a little overconfident in how you were estimating things. You probably don't know this stuff as well as you need to. The other flip side of this is you can also get a student who is really underconfident in how well they know things. And this will also help them deal with that, with that system as well. I'm a big fan of certainty-based marking. It's one of those things that for students, it takes them quite a bit of getting used to on how it works, but once they figure it out, they find it really incredibly useful. Problem with certainty-based marking is of course that you get grades that range from 300 out of 100 to negative 600 out of 100. And so how you fit that into a normal grading scheme is a bit on the difficult side. Um, for this reason, I've actually not put these assignments in as part of the grade um, for my class, but students are expected to do them along the way, and most of the students will take, take advantage of it along the way. I have a little trick that I use to make sure that they do it a little bit later on that Michael is actually going to really enjoy, because I'll go ahead and give you the sneak the steep preview of this Michael it's the progress bar that forces them to do it um, and makes them feel the the desperate need to do it <laughs> great that's perfect um, so the next the last piece of the the different assignments here um, is kind of a generic test review. And so this takes the form of um, kind of what most of you would probably expect to see. It's a bunch of problems that students are expected to solve. It functions fairly the same as the practice problems from before with essentially one important difference. And that is I've switched up the feedback, the, I've switched up the question behavior to immediate feedback rather than adaptive mode. One of the problems that I saw while my students were using this is that they would sit down and do the test review when it was on adaptive mode. And eventually, after 20 or so tries, they'd get the answer to the problem and, and then say, oh, I figured it out. I know what I'm doing. Move on to the next problem, take five or 10 tries on that problem, say, oh, I finally figured this one out, move on to the end. Come in a few days later, take the test, not do very well on the test, and then later say to me, well, I got 100 on the test review. I thought I was doing well on it. We go back and look at their attempt history, and, we, and I'm looking at them saying, you see how many times you got this question wrong? On the test, there isn't the lovely Moodle check button. This paper test does not let you check your answers over and over and over again until you are fi until you finally have it right. And so I switched over to immediate feedback so that it forces them to put in an answer and check it and see what it check to see what it is. 
And then, at the end of it, they can't put any new answers in. They have to end the attempt and see a grade for what they would have gotten on the very first try on all of those problems. And so that grade signal there is a very powerful signal to them to say, I really don't know this as well as I, um, as well as I need to. Kim, to answer your question on the, the different behaviors, um, the confusion on that, there is a little bit at the beginning of the year, um, and I spend a good bit of time on that, talking about that with my students in class. The nice piece of this, the, the nice piece about the quiz module too, is there is that introduction that you can use, particularly at the beginning of the year when students are getting used to the different types of these things, where you can put in, this quiz is going to be using this sort of behavior, and I don't ever use the terms immediate feedback or adaptive mode with my students. I just kind of explain to them how it's going to work. In the case of nearly all of these things, though, they have unlimited attempts, and so even if they don't really understand exactly how it's going to work, they can keep doing it until they finally get it, and so it works out for them. The only place where it really matters to them is on the quizzes. Uh, what I call what I call the quizzes, which are the the time practice, um, where they have just two attempts, and it is deferred feedback. Um, deferred feedback is the easiest one to understand, though, so that also helps along the way. Yes, it does. All right, so that's the that's the kind of the basic design of all of this stuff and how it's how it's all set up. There's a few other pieces here that are, are really fairly important to how you set it up and make sure that it stays useful and helpful over the long term. And I've already mentioned feedback as being kind of the most important thing, and I'm a very firm believer that that's true. One of the other beautiful things about the quiz system in Moodle is it gives you statistics on every single question that you put in a quiz. And this is one of the this is one of the items that you can see here. This is a particular question from one of my practice assignments. And this is just a small subset of the report here that shows all of the answers that a student gave that I don't already have some feedback for. And so if I'm looking at these things here, I can see that there's a few answers that pop up over and over and over again, and a couple variations on them. So this negative 1.128, negative 0.128, negative 0.12, and 0.128 down here. All the same answer, minus a negative sign here. I can now sit down and try to figure out how students arrived at that number. And in this particular case, because of the negative sign on it and the uh, particular question that I'm asking here, it's actually a really straightforward thing for me to look at this and say, oh, this is a student who didn't convert a Celsius temperature into Kelvin before they were doing the calculations. And then you also see this 7.84 atmospheres as well, which is the same essentially variation on the same problem with an extra little mistake added on in addition to it. And so right away, if you look at the percentages over here, you can see that I'm, this is, that one mistake alone is 4% of all of the wrong responses for this particular quiz. You add in this 2%, another 2% here, another 1% here, another 1% there, that's 8% of all of the total wrong responses for this quiz that I can solve with just, in this case, two different sets of feedback, which will essentially be the same thing. You can take the time to do that for all of the questions along the way, then students really get a good sense while they're working through why they're getting the problems wrong, what are the mistakes they are making, and what they need to do to fix them. So that then they can, on the next problem, do it differently and, and better, hopefully. The next piece that I think is really important is how you structure the homework practices themselves. 
homework should not just be this monolithic thing that you throw it at the students and just kind of let them figure it out. Homework is designed to be practice and help them figure things out along the way. You don't just throw someone in the middle of something crazy and expect them to be able to pull it off on the first try. This is another report that you can see inside of the quiz statistics on Moodle that is just kind of built in. This is the statistics for different question positions for the each question on the quiz. And so the red bars are essentially, it's called the uh, facility index, um, but essentially this is how easy the question is. Essentially what percentage of the students got it right. Sort of, there's a couple of little twists in there because of all of the um, multiple chances that students have, but that's more or less what it is. And so you can see here, this is this is kind of the design I'm shooting for. Hopefully a reasonably easy question to get them kind of into the mix, figure out what's going on, make sure that they can function. Progressively add, say, a new trick, a new wrinkle, a new issue that they have to figure out along the way. Each progressive problem gets just a little bit harder and a little bit harder. So eventually they get to the point where they're solving more and more complicated things, but you've gradually worked them into it. A little slightly easier problem at the end is always helpful, makes them feel a little bit better at the end about it. Um, but sometimes this is, uh, you can see here, I'm only using four questions for this one particular homework assignment. Um, it's more important in my mind at a certain point to just make sure that you're getting all of the things that you need to get across in each one of them. The other piece here is making sure that students have enough time to do these things. So these are a group of times that I just kind of picked at random out of a practice assignment to get a sense of how long it's going to take students to do. This is another thing that is just built straight into the Moodle quiz system. And so some of these things you can look at and say, wow, this first student here spent an hour and 19 minutes on this homework assignment. And there at the end, you have a student that spent 100, one minute and, and 50 seconds. How in the world does that happen? Well, so these are actually Michael, these are actually somewhat typical because it represents kind of two very different students and how they're doing these sorts of things. The first student there, the hour and 19 minutes, is a student who's really struggling with it and sitting there trying to answer these questions over and over and over again and can't really figure it out. Quite frankly, if I had a chance to say to this student in the middle of the homework assignment, stop, come in, sit with me, let's work on it, then I would. And I try to keep an eye on the times, try to keep an eye on the times so that I can catch these students along the way and say, you know, you're really spending too much time on these homework assignments. If you need some help, then come in and get some help from me. 26 minutes, that's a reasonable amount of time for homework. The one minute and 50 seconds. Well, there's two ways that you can interpret that. And really, it depends on which student it is is, is actually doing that. Um, one way to interpret that is, oh, they got the answers from somebody and they just typed them in really quickly. Possibility. In the case of this particular quiz and that particular student that that one minute and 50 seconds represents, that's actually a student who is um, very diligent about doing all of their homework assignments on paper first and working them all out and getting an answer and then and only then going into Moodle and typing in their answers to make sure that they have them right. And so they can take one minute and 50 seconds there um, because that represents essentially how long it took them to type in their answers into Moodle, not how long it took them to figure out the answers. In any case, you can get a good sense from these numbers all the same of how long it's taking most of these students to do these assignments and somewhere in the neighborhood of a 20 or 30 minute range is is reasonable but you're going to see this variation along the way it's still important to look at to get a sense of who's spending a lot of time on this how much time are they taking is this a consistent problem making sure that they're doing well along the way
one of the one of the other pieces here when you're designing something with a practice to make sure that students are learning things to remember is this the forgetting curve which I, I, I imagine everyone has seen at some point along the way we forget the things that we don't use and anytime we use something again we remember a little more of it the next time so if you can design your homework and your practice so that you are repeating things over a long period, then you help students just intuitively get all of these things kind of arranged in their brain and get them to the point where they can remember it. And so this is a fairly typical structure that I will use to teach a topic and then make sure that it's being practiced for a good period of time. So we may, I may teach a particular topic in class on a Monday. And then Tuesday night, I have students working on a practice assignment on that topic. On Wednesday night, I'll give them a second, more difficult practice assignment on that same topic. And at the same time, give them one of those time practices, the quizzes, that they have to do as well. Usually this first quiz is a, a bit on the easier side, more similar to the first batch of homework than it is to the second batch of homework. Then on Thursday, I'll give them another quiz on that same topic, another practice thing. And so essentially, I've now taken four days where I've gotten students working on that same topic along the way. You have to remember that all of these assignments are really short and small, and so they get a chance to do it and get a chance to practice it, and then get a chance to move on and do something else. So on Tuesday, we're introducing another topic in class, and this topic might take two days to do. And so then on Thursday night, they're working on homework for this new topic, the same time they're taking a quiz on the first one, and then on Friday, they're doing again the second homework and the first quiz on that topic. So you can see I'm building in the repetition that they need along the way to make sure that they're really remembering these things as they go. And so here is um, and so here is the 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 trick for those of you. So if you have not ever seen uh. Michael's progress bar plugin, then you absolutely need to go pick it out. Um, when I installed progress bar on our Moodle site and started using it in class, I turned our my class average for homework from about a 70% turn in rate to about a 90% turn in rate. Get this nice lovely so this first bar up here is is nice and lovely it's a whole big pile of green checks that the students just love to sit there and they say oh my goodness i'm doing so great in here i have all of these green checks and what you find is that they have an extreme motivation to keep this progress bar looking like this because just one red x in the middle of all of this means that they have now ruined that whole progress bar. And every time they log in to the course, they see this progress bar staring them at the, in the face up at the top of the course with that one little solitary red X in there. And no one likes that. And there are, I have students in my class who will go to great lengths to make sure that every single thing is checked off in that progress bar so that they make sure that they're in good shape. So going back to the going back to Michael's question from earlier the certainty based marking quizzes that I use don't have a grade associated with them but they do show up in the progress bar and so I have quite a few students who end up doing these um, certainty based marking quizzes just to get the green check in there um, along the way they're also doing quite a few practice problems and so um, it, that's certainly a helpful bit along the way when you start getting into students like this down here at the bottom who've missed a number of assignments, they can see very quickly, you know, I've missed a number of assignments. I really need to catch things up. I've got to figure out a way to do this. Um, in fact, in this particular case, you could probably see that this is probably a student who had one bad night or something where they just didn't get to any of the things that they were expected to get to. Like I said, 
introducing the progress bars changed homework turn-in percentages dramatically in my class. If you haven't installed it, you really need to. Um, and so, Michael, I really am kind of expecting the check at this point. So just make sure that I get that soon. If you want to refund some of my uh, Moot US uh, registration fee, that'd be an OK thing um, in, on my book. All right. Um, the other piece, and the, kind of the last piece on this, is um, is you've got to set up some support mechanisms for students. And so I've set up uh, forums in my course that are designed as essentially help forums. There's not a whole lot of discussion to be had in a chemistry class. There aren't really many things in a high school level chemistry class that are really controversial topics that we need to talk about. Certainly we're not arguing about what the formula of a particular thing is. There is a very clearly defined answer for that that we've quite frankly known since the more or less the 1800s. And so there's really no need to have big discussions like that sort of thing. But having help is a big important piece here. And so I have students uh, will post questions in the forum. And in fact, they're expected and graded on having something post in this, um, having something posted in, in here, and it is graded at some point. And so they're expected to either ask a question along the way or the flip side here is to answer a question. So this would be the answer that someone gave to this particular question here. And yes, they are even putting in equations into their um, forum posts. Uh, you can incentivize that with grades fairly quickly. Um, and so they get used to doing that sort of thing along the way. And it makes the this system of an, you know, this online bar, uh, this online system, make sure that they have a, a little bit more of a personal touch. It's just the students in their class that they can um, communicate with here and they really figure out kind of who's helpful in the class and, and make sure that they're helping each other. You'll see in many cases, a lot of uh, kind of friendships develop over the course of the, over the course of the class because students are kind of working with each other along the way. So is it perfect? Oh dear God, no. Um, I wish it were. Um, if you ever get to, a get to a point though where you think what you're doing in the classroom is perfect, then I think you are going in blind anymore because you can never get to that point. A few of the issues that I have um, one is, uh, is a particular problem that I really don't have a solution for at this point, um, but one that keeps coming up over and over again. Students need to come in in the morning or in the afternoon, need a little bit of help with a problem that they didn't, they couldn't figure out, they didn't want to post it in the forum for whatever reason, they're asking me for help, some help on it. And my first question to them is, well, can I see the work that you did so I can figure out what you're doing wrong? And they say, well, I did the work in my calculator. I, I, don't, I can't really show it to you. So there's the sense that because these problems are done on Moodle, that all of their work needs to be virtual too. I have a hard time training them to say, pull out a piece of paper and work out the problem on a piece of paper before they actually try to type their answer into Moodle. They think as long as they can just get an answer, then that's good enough. There is, of course, the, the other possibility of some cheating from time to time. All of these things are, are practice things. And so I'm, I, I put cheating in, in quotation marks here because it, in my mind, it, while it's kind of defeating, it, it's defeating the purpose of what we're doing here, at the end of the day, everybody should be making hundreds on all of these practice assignments anyway. What's really going to bite them in the end is that the tests don't have these all these cute little options for them, and I proctor all of my tests in class so that they don't ever have the option of cheating. Um, so it all catches them up along the way. They really do end up cheating themselves. Still an issue that comes up every now and then. Uh, the third bit is just there are a few there are a few places where um, 
there are a few places where uh, I've had to find assistance on getting everything into Moodle has resulted in a few uh, what I'm going to call hacky questions where it works okay for what it's designed for, but it's certainly not the greatest thing that I've ever seen. Uh, probably the, the worst offender is a system where students have to draw a structure um, and I've managed to kind of hack it together with a drag and drop question from the Open University, um, but it's not the prettiest thing I've ever seen. It certainly works, um, but it's just not the greatest. The most important bit in all of this is just that this takes so much time. Going through all of those questions and seeing what the common wrong answer is for. And then making sure that all of that feedback gets in there and the feedback is good and useful and helpful along the way is really what takes so much time in all of this. At the end of the day though, it saves you a lot of time along the way because students can figure things out for themselves, be more independent in terms of how they're getting help along the way, and that saves them a lot of time too. One thing that I still want to implement that I haven't had a chance to yet is going back to the space versus mass practice. I need some longer term spacing that I still haven't introduced yet um, in the term of, in the form of some random quizzes along the way that pull from things much earlier in the course. Um, that's a project hopefully for either this summer or the next summer. And so that's the um, that in a nutshell is how I do homework. Um, uh, practice is one of those kind of things that I think is is really important, and um, making sure that students can get to that uh, get to the point where they're really automatic means that at the end of my class I can throw problems that for other classes would be really very difficult, and um, my students will just look at them and say, "Okay, well I see all the little pieces here." I know what to do with all the little pieces. It's just a matter of connecting the pieces together and then moving on. So uh, what questions do you have? What can I answer for you? Um, what did you find helpful? What did you find not so helpful? Thanks for, thanks for being here. Yeah, you can't let a chemist give a presentation without like working in a demo at some point. And so I, you know, I like to light things on fire. In in the world of chemistry teachers, there are kind of two different camps of people. There's a group of people that um, had a chemistry teacher at some point in their life who liked to light things on fire and there they were already a little bit of pyromaniac in the first place and really enjoyed that and decided oh maybe i want to do chemistry um so that's me um and so that is actually um some uh, flammable club moss um powder that you can sprinkle in the air above a bunsen burner and uh light it uh, light it on fire. Yes, Sam, I do try to light up their lives as much as I can. Although generally I'm trying not to light up them as much as I am other flammable things. Yeah, Kim, the, the question behaviors are really, are, are really an amazing feature um, in, in Moodle. Yeah, yes, people, people are flammable. Um, I mean, we have, we have body fat. There's, you can light a person on fire. Try not to do that every day. Well, I appreciate y'all taking the time to come. Um, if you have any thoughts on the presentation, anything that um, you'd like to know a little bit more about, anything I can do better, there's a feedback. Uh, item for you to uh, complete in the course itself um, since you showed up here and if you do that then um, then there's a little badge waiting for you when you complete the two so if you're hunting badges this time around then then go for it yeah i if y'all are doing a, a working group on quiz i'd love to be a part of that um i figured i'd show up at, at some working group while i was up there um, if y'all are doing one on quiz i'd definitely show up for that
thank you guys for coming. Hey Joshua, it's Shane here. Um, I just wanted to jump in and say uh, thank you very much for your time and for presenting today. Um, certainly left with a lot more information and uh, it's been great, thank you. Thanks Shane, thanks for organizing this and having us.